Yeah, okay, I get it. It's hurtful. It hurts. If I had a heart, you would have heard it. <sighs> All right. Let's go ahead and pray real quick before we dive into God's Word. Dear Heavenly Father, God, thank you for testimonies. Thank you for hearing stories. God, thank you for your amazing, amazing grace that we just got to sing that song, and it's just so cool to be reminded of your grace. God, I pray as we dive into your word that you would speak to each of our hearts, that this would be a message that is not my message, it's not my agenda, it's not something I feel like I need to, to say to other people, but God, you would even speak to my heart. You would simply use me as a vessel to speak to each person in here. And Lord, we would walk away from this morning having heard from your word and been, and been challenged by you to make a change, to live more righteously. In your name I pray, amen. All right, so last week we started this short series. This thing never works when I want to do it. Um, where we're looking at a couple of the different minor prophets. And last week we looked at Habakkuk, okay? And so I gave you guys plenty of time to find it. Today I'm going to give you a chance again because we're looking at another minor prophet. We're going to look at Malachi. So this one's a little bit easier to find because it's the very last book of the Old Testament. So you can just turn to the New Testament and start working backwards. Um, but we're going to look at the book of Malachi, the message that God shared through Malachi. Okay? While I try to get this thing to work. There we go. Malachi. That's how you spell it in case you need it. All right? And I just want to kind of give real quick a little bit of background to kind of put us in perspective of where we are. So last week we read Habakkuk, and I talked about how the minor prophets are, the the way that the Old Testament's organized, you got the major prophets and the minor prophets, but that doesn't mean the minor prophets are like the lesser prophets. Their messages are just generally shorter, so they called the minor prophets. But they worked in connection with the major prophets, and so they're not in chronological order. So um, last week we looked at Habakkuk, which prophesied before Israel was taken into captivity to, um, to Nineveh, to Babylon. Excuse me, Babylon, not Nineveh. That would be bad if I said the wrong thing. To Babylon. So that's what they were prophesying. Habakkuk was written at the end of the 7th century B.C. So there's a couple different ideas. It, it doesn't give an exact in the book. So a couple of prevailing thoughts are around 625 B.C. or 606 B.C., but in the last portion of the 7th century. BC. So that's when Habakkuk was written. That's the book we looked at last week. He, in the book, in the conversation that he's having with God, he prophesies about Babylon coming and judging Israel and taking them into captivity because of their evilness, because of their wickedness, that they had wandered from God. And so God was going to use Babylon to judge them. Okay? So when that actually came to be, Israel was actually taken captive by the Babylonians in 586 BC. Okay, so toward uh, uh, in, the, in the early, sorry, in, uh, in the in the, I keep saying I want to say like three different things in my head at the same time. Around six twenty or six ten or something like that, BC was when Habakkuk told him it was going to happen. Five eighty six is when it actually did happen. All right, I got through that part for some reason. That was really hard. Um, so you see that he he prophesied a little bit ahead of time about that, okay? And so that happened in 586, and then in 537, Israel returned back to, uh, Israel returned from captivity back to Jerusalem. So they returned after about 70 years in captivity, they went back to their homeland, and they rebuilt, and they got back to normal, Uh, they set up their temple again, they set up the way that they do things with with the sacrifices and all that stuff, and they got back to normal in, in, um, in 537. Malachi was written in 424, so it's about 100 years after they've returned from captivity. Now, I share some of those dates, and I struggled through some of those dates because they're, they're important as we go through the message of Malachi, okay? We need to understand, Habakkuk warned them they were going to be judged because they had wandered from God. They had, they had not been faithful to God. They had started doing other things. They were not obeying him, so he used Babylon to judge them. 
They were, in, they were in judgment for a period of time. They were allowed to go back. And 100 years later, Malachi is writing a book to them because they've since returned back to where they were before they had been judged by God. So it's like they, they, they didn't learn their lesson. They were judged. Okay, I feel bad. You know, we'll go back. And then they, they got right back into what they were doing before. So Malachi is writing and telling them almost the same things that they had, been, that they had done before they were taken into captivity by Babylon the first time because of their sin. And so it's, it's just this, is if you've studied the history of Israel, it's like a cycle of just constant wandering from God. And God judges them and then restores them and then they wander from God again. And God judges them and then restores them and they wander from God. And it's just ridiculous. Like you read through the Old Testament, you just want to jump back in the pages and be like, hey guys, learn your lesson. Figure it out. Don't do it again. Right, And I think that's a lot of times, like when I first read that, I'm like, oh, come on, Israel. God is constantly taking care of you. Like I just think of some of the things that they witnessed firsthand, like, like the Red Sea parting and them walking through, literally looking at walls of the sea on either end, or walking through and driving. How does that alone not continually come to your mind? You're like, okay, yeah, yeah, God is pretty cool. Maybe I should stick with him because he has done an amazing thing in my life. But they forget. And they kind of wander away and they start doing their own thing and God has to judge them. Then God restores them again because he loves them. And then shortly after that, they start to do what, what they were doing before. God has to judge them. It's just this vicious cycle that happens over and over and over. And so I want to look at the message of Malachi. Because in this book, in this message, God again accuses Israel of several things. Now, what's interesting about the book of Malachi, it's written a little bit differently than most other prophetic books. It's written as though it's a dispute between two parties. And Malachi's sort of sitting there watching it. So it's kind of like it's in a courtroom. You got one side and you got the other side. And this one makes the accusation. And this one goes, prove it. And this one proves it. And Malachi's kind of writing back and forth. And so you, you, like you're part of this story watching these two parties go back and forth, forth arguing. And the two parties that are arguing, that are having this dispute, are God and Israel. So God makes an accusation. Israel says, prove it. God proves it. Okay. So we're going to, we don't have time, honestly, to go through the entire book of Malachi and look at every single thing. Because there's a lot in this book. So I encourage you at some point, take time to read through the book of Malachi. Because what God does is he pulls out five or six, depending on how you want to break it down, five or six different sins in Israel's life and accuses them of it. Say, this is what you're doing. And they say, how? And then he tells them how. And so we don't have time to look at all five or six this morning. But I want to look at at least a few of them and kind of look at what what God says. And then we're going to step back and say, okay, God said that to Israel. Israel said, how have we done that? I want to take uh, some time after we look at what God says to Israel and ask those same questions to ourselves. How have we done that? We're going to see what God says to Israel, but then we're going to back up and say, okay, what about us? How have we done that? So we're going to look at three different kind of main parts of Malachi. First one is in chapter 1, starting in verse 6. Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 6. God says this, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests who despise my name. But you say, now this is Israel, this is Israel's response to what God just said. But you say, how have we despised your name? Verse 7. By offering, nope, but you say, yeah, how have we despised your name? Verse 7, by offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. And we're going to stop there for a second. What we need to make sure we understand is the context, is the culture. They, in the Old Testament, Jesus had not come yet. Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice. We do not have to sacrifice animals on the altar anymore. Because, as Hebrews says, he was sacrificed once for all. But in the Old Testament, they had different sacrifices that they made to cover their sins. So they would take these animals, and they would take them to the altar, and they would sacrifice them. Now, God was very specific. 
they were to be the best of their animals. They were to be without blemish. They were not just, just oh, you know what, we don't really, that one's not going to produce a lot of meat. That's kind of a, 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 a small sheep. We'll give him that one. That's one they, no. They were supposed to give him the best one, and they were to take it, and the priest knew this. The priest had all this thing that they were supposed to do, all these rules that they were supposed to follow in order to make these sacrifices proper. And so what he's saying to them is you have polluted because you have, you have sacrificed these things on the altar that are not good. You have despised my name. He's talking about this idea of honor because right there in verse 6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is my honor? If I am a master, where is my fear? He's calling out to Israel saying, you guys are dishonoring me. You are not giving me the best of what you have. You're giving me the leftovers, the extra. Whatever you don't care about, push that off on God. But we're going to hold what's best for us. You're despising. You're not obeying me because I've told you it has to be this. And as a father and as a master, you should do what I say. That's the idea of having a father or a master. You obey them. But you've decided you don't have to obey me. You you can kind of just do your own thing and say, well, it's good enough. And he's saying, you're despising my name. You're dishonoring me. Continue reading, verse 8. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Then he poses a very good question. Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts? He draws this idea as we know how to show honor to people that, that deserve honor. If, if someone of high honor, like let's say you're the governor, is going to come over to your place, you're going to kill the fatted calf for him. You're going to give him the best meal. You're going to treat him with honor. You're going to put him at the nice part of the table. He's going to feel honored and respected as a person. And you are going to do your best to take care of him. So why are you treating me like I'm nothing? But you would not do that to a person who's in authority. We know how to treat people in authority the right way. We understand etiquette. And he's calling them to that, saying, you, you, you wouldn't do that to your governor who's merely a man, but you're doing it to me, and I'm God. I'm God, and you're despising me. You're dishonoring me. Now, we're not going to read the whole thing, he says, but skip down to verse 14. This is the end of this accusation. Verse 14 says this, Cursed be the cheat who has a male in his flock and vows it, yet sacrifices to the Lord what is blemished. So you have something better. You're giving me something that's not as good. And then he makes this statement, calling them to repentance in this area. For I am a great king, says the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. He is God, whether we're going to treat him that way or not. He is king, and it's up to us to decide whether we're going to treat him that way. And so what he's calling to Israel is, you know I'm king, you know I'm God, you know the rules I've set up, you know what sacrifices are supposed to be like, and you've decided you don't have to follow that, you're dishonoring my name, but I am king, I am God. So get with the program. He calls them repentance back to what they're supposed to do. He doesn't just accuse them. He tells them what they're doing is wrong, and then he calls them back to repentance, to return to the way it's supposed to be. Let's look at another accusation that God gives. Go to verse 2, or chapter 2, verse 10. Chapter 2, verse 10. Starting in verse 10, it says this, Have we not all one Father? Has not one God created us? Why then are we faithless to one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has been faithless, 
An abomination has been committed in Israel and in Jerusalem. So he's talking about the fact that they are not faithful. There's a lack of faithfulness going on. Now skip all the way to verse 14. Because this is where the question that Israel asks comes into play. Verse 14 of chapter 2, Israel says this, But you say, why does he not? Referring to verse 13, I'll just read verse 13. And the second thing you do, you cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer regards the offering or accepts it with favor from your hand. In other words, God's saying, I'm not accepting your offerings to me. Even if they are good ones, he's continuing on and saying, I'm not accepting them. So then verse 14, but you say, why does he not? Why does he not accept our offerings? Verse 13, it says, you're, you're crying over it. You're upset about it. You're, you're frustrated. You're covering my altar with tears because you don't know why I'm not accepting your offering. Because the Lord was witness between you and the wife of your youth to whom you have been faithless, though she is your companion and your wife by covenant. So what God calls them to in this section is their faithlessness. And he talks both about the covenant between him and them as a nation, the marriage between God and Israel, and he also talks about their faithlessness between them and their wives. So it's showing up in two ways. They've wandered from God. They've, they've walked away, sort of divorced God. Divorce is also very big at this time in Israel. They're just getting divorced and getting married to other things. Other things. They're getting married to other people. They're just, that would be really weird. They're deciding, you know what? I, I'm tired of this. I don't want to get, I, I, I'm, I'm walking away from this one. I'm going to divorce and go to someone else. And it was becoming a big problem in Israel. They were just getting divorced almost for no reason. Other than, well, I, I like the look of that one now. She looks better. I'm going I'm to leave and go over there. And they're even marrying outside of Israel, which God told him, don't do that. Because I want you as my people to be pure. But they're marrying women that worship other gods. And it's they're they're becoming very faithless. There's a lack of faithfulness going on, both to each other and to God. Because they're walking away, they're doing their own thing, they're pursuing their own thing. And God calls them to that. And he says, you guys need to stop. Then look at verse 16, the very last sentence. Again, this is when God calls them to repentance. After calling them out for being a a people who are not faithful. They're not faithful to their covenant with God. And they're not faithful to their covenant that they made with each other. The very last sentence of verse 16 says this. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. Again, he, he shows them what they're doing is wrong and then draws them back to do what's right. He calls them to repentance a second time. A second time he calls them to repentance because they are being faithless because, because they're not remaining faithful to God or to each other. And that's why he's not accepting their offering. And Honestly, it makes sense. If if I was not being faithful to my wife, and she knew it, but I came home one day and gave her some flowers, those flowers mean nothing to her. Who cares I'm giving her flowers? She knows I'm being faithless. She knows I'm not being faithful to her, so who cares that I give her some flowers that smell good and look pretty? And that's what God is saying. Say, look, You're being faithless, and then you're offering this to me, thinking, oh, everything's okay now. No, it's not okay. I don't want another sacrifice. I want your heart. I want you to follow me, not in your actions, but in your heart. I, the Lord, have been faithful to you. Consider the history that we looked at. Over and over, they wander from God, so he disciplines them. But then he brings them back and restores them again, and then again they wander from God. So then he disciplines them, restores them, brings them back. They wander from God. He has been faithful to them since the beginning, and they continue to be faithless. That's, I told you guys last week, that's why 
one of the one of the minor prophets that I really like is the book of Hosea. Man, that perfect picture. Now I, I told you I feel bad for Hosea because his life was a message, and it's not a message any of us would want to live. But the fact that he married a woman of unfaithfulness and constantly had to go get her and bring her back because she kept being unfaithful to him. And the whole point of that message is, hey, Israel, that's you. You continue to wander from God. I continue to bring you back to me. You continue to wander away. You're being faithless. So he calls them to stop doing that at the end. So guard yourselves in your spirit and do not be faithless. One more accusation we're going to look at. Go to chapter 3. Chapter 3, starting in verse 6. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. He's reminding them of their history. There's this constant cycle of walking away from me. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? I think it's very interesting, this idea of returning, what God then accuses them of. Because a lot of times I think we would read that and we would think something, well, of of course, you you need to stop doing what's evil and, and, and Go back to church if you're not going to church and and start reading your Bible more and all these different things that we kind of equate as being a follower and, and making sure we're checking off our list to do the right things. But it's interesting what God specifically says to them right after saying, return to me. Verse eight, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? I think that's a good question. Of all the questions Israel asks, I think that's the best. In, in this book, because how, how do you rob God? I mean, ha ha, give me all your money. What? No, I mean, it's not like I can go up and rob God. He's a little bit bigger than I am, just smack me around a little bit. Not going to work. So they say, but you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. When God calls them to return to him, he first goes after the way they spend their money. Because no other possession we own is more directly tied to our heart than our money. We will not waste our money on things we don't care about. Even if someone can present a really good case for it, even if a missionary or somebody from an organization can give an exquisite presentation, you're like, wow, that's amazing. If you don't have a heart for missions, you're not going to give because you don't care. You see a value in it, but you don't see a value for you. On the flip side, we're willing to waste a lot of our money on things that are about us. We spend enormous amounts of money just to have fun. And I'm not against having fun. I think everybody knows that. I like to have fun. I can't afford it right now, but I like it. Someday I hope to do it again. We like to have fun. I was talking with someone the other day. The idea of narcissism, everything is about us. That's been around for a long time. That, that, that's nothing new. There's nothing new with narcissism. But I personally believe Americans have perfected it. We are really good at being all about me. Really good at being all about me. And making sure I have enough money for everything I want to do, plus all those vacations, plus constantly getting new stuff, and then at the end I'll toss God a a little bit of change. Now, does God need our money? No, it's all his to begin with. If he wants it, he'll take it. If he wants your money from you, he's going to take it. Because it's all his. He's given it to you to begin with. We are simply supposed to be a steward of everything he has given us. God owns it all. He created the world. He created everything in the world. He gives us the ability to breathe, to walk, to work, to do everything that we need to earn that money. And at any moment, he can say, I'm taking it back now. But all throughout the Bible, 
he's constantly talking about this idea of what we call tithing. And it's interesting, if you study tithing in the Old Testament, we like to put 10% on it. That was only one specific tithe. Israel had several tithes that they had to do. And it equaled close to 26%. Now, in the New Testament, we're never given a specific percentage. Jesus never brings up a specific percentage. So some people would argue, well, it's not the same as the Old Testament. Fine, I'll listen to that argument. But I'm pretty sure Jesus still says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I'm pretty sure he sat at the temple with his disciples and watch a rich man dump a ton of money into the treasury and then watch a poor woman put in a penny or two and say she's given more than he has. Because it's not about how much you have. It's about what you're doing with it. The woman had nothing, but she was willing to give something. And so Jesus said, yeah, that guy, he gave a lot of money. She's giving her heart in the form of that money. And so when God calls Israel to return to him, right away he attacks their wallet. And he says, you are robbing me because you are not giving me what I am due. God is not asking them to be poor and destitute and give everything to him. He's asking them to be faithful with what God has given them and giving it back to him, the portion that he has requested. Verse 8, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. Look at verse 10. Once again, he calls them to repent. Bring the full tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We're always wanting to hold on to it for ourselves because we see a need might be coming in the future. And so we've got to make sure we stockpile and are prepared for every possible situation. And because of that, you're robbing me. And he's saying, no, bring it all. Give me what I have asked you and watch me take care of you in ways you can't even imagine. But you first have to trust me and give me what I've requested. You don't get to hold on to it for yourself and then say, God, why aren't you blessing me when I have a need? Give me. Show me that you love me by by through your wallet, by giving it to me. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse and then watch out. Because I will bless you in ways you can't even think about it. I mean, I grew up in a family that was extremely poor. We didn't have a lot. I didn't wear clothes from a store. I'm sure at some point they were at a store, but we didn't get them there. We got them from somebody else, who got them from somebody else, who got them from somebody else. We got all our food at a food bank. That was our normal food. We didn't go to a grocery store. We got food bank food. If you've ever eaten food bank food, it's a little out of date. It's still considered food in the non-traditional sense. Most of it's canned, so it lasts for a long time. But but that's where we got all our food. I remember I would go with my mom once a month, and we would go load up our van from the food bank. And then that's what we had to eat for the month. There was no, hey, let's go get some snacks. Let's grab some Cheez-Its. No, it's like, okay, let's hope they have some bread today. That's how I grew up. And one thing I remember about my parents, that's probably one of the biggest testimonies to me, is that no matter how tough things were, they always made sure to tithe their full amount. And there were several months We couldn't pay rent. And my parents had to choose between that and tithing. And they chose to tithe. And I remember sitting in our living room. I was a little kid, but we would pray, God, take care of us right now because we don't know how this is going to happen. And I remember one month, I don't remember every single time, but I remember one month very specifically 
My mom went out to check the mail. We had just finished praying. My mom went out to check the mail, and she came in, and there was this letter that had no name on it. It was just addressed to us, but didn't have a return address. She opened up the envelope, and in there was a check. And again, it was like one of these money order things. She didn't know who it came from. And it was literally down to the penny what we needed to pay our rent. No more. It's not like, hey, we also get to go out to eat. No, it was just enough to get by. I was little at the time, but I saw that God takes care of us when we are willing to show him that we love him. God calls Israel to return to him, stop wandering away. And then he goes right after the way they spend their money, the possessions, the things that they think they own. He goes right after that. We looked at three accusations. Honestly, Israel has been unfaithful. That's easy to see. And I think we can ask those same questions of ourselves. How have we, in our own life, personally, how have we dishonored God? How have we been unfaithful to God? How have we robbed God? These are questions that each one of us needs to ask in our heart. These are questions that we should constantly consider because like Israel, it's very easy to walk away from God again. We live in a world that draws us away from him. We are seduced and tempted by all the things of this world. There's always going to be something else you want to buy. There's always going to be something else you think you need There's always going to be another reason why not to do what you're supposed to do. But God, just like God called Israel, God calls us to repentance too. To identify those things in our life where we're not being faithful, where we're not honoring God, and where maybe we're robbing God, and say, what do I need to do to change? See, as you read through the book, each time God makes an accusation, Israel asks Show me how. And then God does. Because the reality is, Israel was guilty of every one of those sins. And they didn't get to say, well, God, you don't understand. I have this friend, and they tempt me a lot. And they make me spend money on things I don't want to spend money on. Or they do stuff, and I'm, I'm just kind of follow, I follow them. God never allows an excuse He simply says, this is what you're doing wrong, now stop it and return to me. And just like Israel is guilty of every one of those, and they have no one to blame but themselves, we are guilty too. And we have no one to blame but ourselves. We have chosen at times to walk away. We have chosen at times to be unfaithful, to not obey what God has called us to do. We have chosen at times to spend our money, spend our possessions on other things, knowing we're not going to be able to give God what he's requested from us. We have been unfaithful. We have robbed God. We have dishonored him. But then here comes the good part. Because in the book of Malachi, twice, in chapter 4 and in chapter 3, God tells them that he's sending the Messiah. He talks about sending the next prophet to prepare the way for the Messiah. That's John the Baptist. And then he says, the Lord is coming. He reminds them again, I'm going to restore you again. He calls them to repentance. He tells them all the things that they're doing wrong. And then once again, he comes back to his own faithfulness to us. Despite all of that, I'm sending the Messiah. Despite all of that, I still love you. And I'm still out to restore you. I want to draw you back to me because I want this relationship with you. Jesus came as the Messiah. He came to set right what was wrong. He came to purify and cleanse what was evil. To save us from the punishment of of our sin. Even though we as people are continually unfaithful people, 
constantly choosing our own way and walking away from God and not doing what we're supposed to, God still sent Jesus. He was still faithful even when we were not. And that's where we need to land. Despite our unfaithfulness, God's love and faithfulness continues. Despite our unfaithfulness, God's love and faithfulness continues. He calls us to repent of our unfaithfulness. He doesn't say, hey, it's okay, you're allowed. No, he calls us to stop. But he is faithful nonetheless. But his love and his faithfulness will will remain even when we are not faithful. That is the overall truth that is presented in the book of Malachi. We as people were very unfaithful. God is so faithful we can't even understand it. He loves us more than we will ever get, that we will ever comprehend. The things, we can all think of the things that we have done in our life, the ways we have wandered from God, and we might sit here and say, yeah, I'm not as bad as the guys that got up on stage earlier. You're looking at it from the wrong perspective. Because sin is sin to God. We're all sinners. We've all been unfaithful. We've all wandered from God. And God has been faithful to all of us despite all of that. So the only question that comes back to us is how are we going to stop? How are we going to repent and start being faithful to God? How will we repent and return to him and show him that we love him because he has loved us? As the praise band is coming up, I just want to simply close in a short prayer. But my, my biggest challenge is, is I pray that everyone in this room would consider those questions, those accusations that God gave to Israel, those questions we pose to ourselves. Ask God to show you areas in your life where you're not being faithful, where you're robbing God, where maybe you're dishonoring him. And then seek repentance in those areas. Repent means to turn and go the other way. Seek repentance in those areas. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, you are so amazing. And I can't even comprehend that you are faithful despite how unfaithful I, in my own life, have been on a regular basis. So God, I pray that we would simply, as people who claim to follow you, Continually ask ourselves the questions, are we being unfaithful? And continue to thank you for your faithfulness, even during those times when we are unfaithful. You may pray. Amen.